step with uh, to talk about the drug make uh, chest and cell rates. Okay, thanks. Thanks everyone for coming. I'm still uh, stay until almost the last of the day. So today I will talk about the uh, fractal uh, conversion of uh, transient degree in KD and higher. So because most of you probably already heard about uh, uh, some introduction about fractals in present and uh, Andrew's talk, so I can go through this slide very quick. So fractals throughout uh, my talk correspond to some new type of RC particles, new type of quasi particles, which contains Restrict mobilities. These are still quasi particles, which means they must be deconfined once you read a quasi particle and its anti particle and spatially separated components. This shouldn't cause a uh, divergent energy. However, it is impossible to move a single quasi particle without touching the other quasi particle without uh, going through an energy barrier. And that also implies that some quasi particles or a group of them can only move within a restrict manifold like a uh, 2D or 3D fractal or 2D plane or even a 1D line. And the uh, intrinsic reason of such kind of fractal behavior is the quasi particle actually carries some quantum number, which is not just conserved uh, globally, it's also conserved on some sub manifold like a fractal or line. And hence, whenever we create quasi particle excitations and move them apart, they have to stay within their restrict manifold. And, uh, as Chris had already mentioned, there is another technology called fractal logical phases, which cannot be described by any kind of TQFT theory. However, they still share much similarities and uh, some features of the usual logical phase of matter. The ground state only contains finite correlation lengths, but they have some large entanglement structures. And the quasi particle can carry some fractional quantum number, and they can have some non true degrading statistics. In 3D and higher. And in addition, the ground state degeneracy, you know, some non trivial topological, it's not a topological degeneracy, it's a global degeneracy which cannot be lifted by any local operators. But such kind of ground state degeneracy will scale with the system, uh, system size in a so extensive way for type 1 fractals. And it also geometry dependent. And this excludes itself from the usual TQFT descriptions. And the uh, Study of fraton actually start with some stabilizer code or quantum information models, and uh, they can be finally generalized to some cage net models, which I will not describe or mention today. And there is a pretty rough and uh, incomplete uh, classification of stabilizer code. We can roughly classify them in two ways. One type of stabilizer code can be called as the CSS code which means uh, the Hamiltonian is just a sum of some local cluster interactions, and there are only two types of cluster interactions. One cluster interaction only contains sigma x operator, so there are some, uh, some like 16 or even 18 number of spins interact together, but they always interact in a sigma x channel. And uh, the other type of interactions only interact in a sigma z channel, and that's all you can expect from the Hamiltonian. So the well-known X cube model, the Bosonic checkboard model, and the, the type two CSS code like the Ha code or Yoshida code all belongs to such kind of CSS code because the stabilizer interaction either all have uh, X interactions or only have Z interactions. And the other type of stabilizer code called the non-CSS code, which means like the Chamon code or the cube of Cahedral code. For each spin cluster interaction, there are both sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z operator involved. And even if you do some uh, local basis change for some sub lattice, it's still impossible to write them in terms of the form of the CSS code. So now we have almost infinite number of these quantum stabilizer codes, which are exactly sub models and their quasi particle excitation really have such kind of fractal behavior. So the next step is, is there any kind of field theory or field theory-like descriptions which can characterize all type of stabilizer code we are already familiar with? This. And um, we know it's not a topological field theory, but to get a good effective field theory which captures the fractal matrix, we at least have three minimal uh, requirements. First, such kind of field theory, if written down, should at least captures the fractonic nature of the quasi-particle excitation. 
And second, because we are looking into some prop ontological order where quasi particles, uh, quasi particle excitation, we can have some non trivial gradient statistics. We hope such kind of field theory can capture the fractionalization of gradient statistics. And we know for proton stabilizer code, we have some global degeneracy, which is system size dependent or geometry dependent. We hope once we write down this theory, the ground state degeneracy and its scale dependent can be immediately calculated like the, we can find some type of Wilson line operator or Wilson membrane operator which help us to calculate the global degeneracy. <coughs> and uh, throughout the past few years, there are lots of development for that. First, for most type of CSS code where the Hamiltonian only contains either sigma x interactions or only sigma z interactions, most of them can be written in terms of the general electron mechanism where in the Bromo already mentioned we can regard them as a general uh, system with a general U1 symmetry such that charge is conserved on some submanifold. And once we engage such kind of theory, then we get a general electromagnetic theory. And second is what I will focus today. It's, a, a to, uh, it's called a fraton transcendent theory. It's not a usual transcendent theory because it's not a logical quantum field theory, but it's still in most of the important and silent features of the 2 plus 1D transcendent theory although we are in 3D and higher. And upon Higgs, all of these fraction transcendent can be written in terms of uh, non-CSS code, like the Chaman code or the q quantum code. And third, there are some higher grand gear theory description for fraction phase of matter, which I probably don't have time to mention today. So first, uh, because every problem already mentioned the multiple theory and the general electron mechanism descriptions for lots of fraton stabilizer code. So we just uh, go through this slide very quickly. Let's see how can we use a general electromagnetic theory to describe the XQ model or other CSS code. Because we still employ the electromagnetic theory, so we must have two essential components. Uh, first, we need a charge, and second, we need to define a flux. And because you need to define a charge, we have to write down a charge conservation law, what we call the generalized Gauss law. So here, uh, in three spatial dimensions, we define three type of electric operator. We only have E x y, E x z, and E y z, which is actually a symmetric uh, tensor which only contains all diagonal components. And I just write down a very special Gauss law that partial i partial j E i j gives the local charge density. This is different from the usual Gauss law where we only have one partial derivative in, uh, in front of the electric operator. And because we have two partial derivative operators in front of each electric operator, what you will find is the charge is not just conserved globally. Instead, on each ij plane, say x, y, y, z, or x, z plane, the charge is always conserved on the two, uh, uh, on three top of two d planes. And uh, once you have the charge conservation law, we can define a conjugate variable, conjugate operator which is the gauge connection operator, which is the conjugate particle of this electric field. And as long as we know what does the loss law look like, we can figure out what is the gauge transformation of this gauge connection. And usually, the magnetic flux operator is the lowest order gauge invariant operator we can write down. So for such kind of gauge structure, there are three types of magnetic flux operator we can define. They are all point-like excitation, even it's 3D. And although we have three flux operators, we'll find the sum of three type of flux operator gives you zero, and that means only two of the flux operators are independent. And here, because the charge is conserved on any arbitrary IJ plane, that implies whenever we have a charge excitation, it is impossible to move them in any direction. Because if I have a charge and I move it up, this will violate the conservation law on this plane. If I move it around, this actually violates the conservation on this particular plane. So there is no way to, for you to move a single charged particle without touching the other, maybe because such kind of motion does not respect the subsystem charge conservation law. And it is the subsystem charge conservation law which gives rise to such kind of fraton behavior. And now back to the stabilizer code. Now we already write on the electron magnetic thing, which contains a Gauss law, which contains a flux operator. And just imagine we have some x squared theory of that. And now let's go into the simplest case. Let's only consider a C2 gauge theory. 
such that the charge density can only take either zero or one value, and the magnetic uh, and the gauge field operator can only take either zero or pi. And then we can write the electric operator and the gauge connection operator in terms of the poly spin operator sigma x and the sigma z, and the, uh, and the poly, uh, poly spin algebra exactly reflects the conjugate relation between this electric field and gauge connection. So now, the Gauss law should be written in terms of some sigma x operators, and the magnetic flux operator should be written in terms of sigma z operators. So on a cubic lattice, let's rewrite such kind of local Gauss conservation law in terms of the sigma x operator. That becomes a 12 sigma x operator living on the hinge of a cube, and uh, they interact with the sigma x channel. So this is the Gauss law. And if we violate the energy minimum of the stabilizer that corresponds to creating a charge excitation. And remember, charge is always conserved on a 2D plane. That is why you cannot move a single charge. And same, the magnetic flux operator finally can be written in terms of the sigma z operator. And these are uh, three type of magnetic flux operator, which involves four sigma z term interact on each vertex in the sigma z channel. And if we violate the energy minimal of the stabilizer, this corresponds to creating a flux-like acceptations. So now it is very clear. In order to write on a proton theory, if we just think about the Maxwell theory or untwisted theory, all we need is we just need to write, write on a general electromagnet uh, such that first it contains a Gauss law. We just write down, uh, we just define some electric operator and write on a Gauss law. And this D1 can correspond to any differential polynomial, which we already introduced an hour ago. Because it is a differential polynomial, it contains different order of partial derivative terms. And to keep the dimension consistent, there should be a coefficient in each term of the polynomial which carries the dimension. This means a UV regularization is very essential, so such kind of differential operators can be well defined on the lattice. And now, what we need to do is we have to choose the appropriate differential operator such that the charge density is not just conserved globally, it's also conserved on some manifold. And once we figure out how to choose the differential operator or differential polynomial, almost everything is done. As long as we have a special differential operator for such kind of generalized uh, Gauss law, then we know what does the gauge transformation look like, and we can define the lowest order gauge invariant operator as the magnetic flux operators. And the same kind of theory we can have is just a magnetic flux fluctuation plus a Gaussian constraint. Asia, I can always make some linear combinations, right, with these TIs. So this is unique up to show, uh, up to up to go into linear combinations. Right? Yes. So in, in principle, it doesn't have to be a sum of different powers. Sometimes you may be able to. And hence, if you want to heat them and uh, co uh, and relate with the CSS uh, fracton code we are familiar with, then the Gauss law can finally be written in terms of uh, spin cluster interaction in the sigma x channel because x operator corresponds to the electric operator. And then its conjugate operator, the gauge connection, becomes the operator. So any magnetic flux operator can be locally written in terms of a spin cluster interaction in the sigma z channel. And because the magnetic flux operator always commute with your Gauss law, that means no matter how complicated these clusters are, every two clusters must commute each other. So that's a commuting projector. And the spin cluster interaction, although you feel it's, it's very complicated with some unspeakable horror, it's exactly solvable. You can get a ground state and an excited state reader every two terms commute. And hence, most of the CSS code can be written in terms of such kind of generalized electromagnetic theory. Then the problem is what happens if a stabilizer code, a fracton code, is a non-CSS code, like a Chamon code, where the only cluster interaction is on such kind of uh, FCC lattice, and there are both X, Y, and Z interaction on the same cluster. And no matter what kind of some lattice transform information to be made, such kind of structure always maintains. Do we have a way to describe such kind of non-CSS code like Chernobyl code? Another question
touching this, which is pretty important, is my previous statement about a generalized electromagnetic field. If we only focus on the Zn gauge field, then we know it's a Piat phase and that corresponds to some proton stabilizer code. But once you go into the U1 limit, and I assume the gauge field is compact, then we have uh, first uh, such kind of U1 phase is usually gapless, then we have to take care of the instant time event because it's a compact gauge field. Uh, but unfortunately, in most uh, cases like those XQ model, where you are limited, the instant time event is usually relevant, and that means you cannot have a deconfined U1 fracton phase. What you will obtain is to get a confined U1 fracton phase because instant time will always proliferate. The next question is Is it possible to construct a very stable deconfined U1 fracton phase, or do we have a special way? which can simply kill all of the instant of events. So to reach this two goal, we actually construct a fracton transcendent theory, which is a time reversal R theory for fracton phase of matter. So what does it mean by fracton transcendent theory? First, uh, the only reason I call it transcendent theory is it inherits most of the interesting and selling features of the 2 plus 1 D transcendence term. Although I'm not focusing on 3D and higher, but it's definitely not a topological theory. So in 2D, in order to construct a transcendent theory, the same thing we can do is we should find a flux with the charge. Because once you have a transcendent theory, whenever you do a flux excitation, such kind of flux excitation should carry a gauge charge. And same, for fraton theory, if we already have a generalized electromagnetic theory, in order to add a transcendence term with that, what we need to do is we need to construct a term where the higher rate gauge flux also carries a fracton charge. So our previous uh, statement, we can write down a uh, generalized uh, Gauss law where D1 and D2 can be some differential output or differential polynomials. And now, what I want to do is I will always find some portion of the flux with your density operator. So this is the flux and the charge binding procedure. And this is the new Gauss law I'm looking at. And in order to reflect this new Gauss law, to a Lagrangian, what we need to do is we need to introduce a Lagrangian multiple, uh, A0 and uh, time this one and uh, release the gauge. And there we comes, uh, there comes our fracton transcendent theory, which has a very similar form of the 2 plus 1 in transcendent theory. There are two type of effect in transcendent theory. First is A1 partial TA2 and A2 minus A2 partial TA1. And this actually means upon quantization, the A1 and A2 two gauge connections becomes a conjugate pairs and they're no longer commute. And second is A0 is combined with the magnetic flux field. That means the flux operator is always bind with the charge operator. And if I'm focusing on the pu gauge theory where the charge density is zero, then we only have A0 minimal coupled with the magnetic flux operator. Is this so far still a reduction science? No, it's not a universal science. Because it looks like a transcendence, but remember d1 and d2 is not partial x partial y. It's a differential polynomial which depends on dx, dy, dz for entire dimension. It can even depend on other differential operators. And same, although I called a1 and a2, the gauge transformation is determined by this differential operator which involves dx, dy, dz. So it's 3D, and the differential derivatives is replaced by such kind of differential polynomial. So the notation of that. True, it's not uh, for any theory with subsystem symmetry, it can be a rotation invariant otherwise. It's not consistent with the subsystem symmetry. And now, what we need to do is, it seems that the only thing we need to do is figure out what are the possible differential polynomials here, which can make this transcendent theory well defined. And there are several minimal requirements for choosing the differential polynomial. First, because I call it a gauge theory, so at least uh, which kind of gauge coupling must be gauge invariant. That's the minimal requirement. The second, because I call it a fracton transcendent theory, that means the flux excitation or charge excitation should have some restrict mobility in like fractons. And that actually implies that a charge and flux operator should be conserved on some subminimal. This is how fracton appears. And the third is uh, additional requirement. Or it, uh, I still want to call it a transcendent theory. It should reproduce some of the interesting property of a 2D transcendent theory. In 2D transcendent theory, the U1 gauge field uh, gauge theory becomes fully flat and 
it has a decompiled place. I think I will give you some reading statistics between the Farsi particles and the, some most healthy world, which give rise to some global degeneracy. And also, in 2 plus 1 neutron sample theory, it will introduce some transverse electron magnetic response, which can be measured in experiment. And also, there are some gauge anomaly on the boundary. So, for 2 neutron sample theory, the 1 dA should be gapless because of the current anomaly. Now, my hope is one of these interesting properties should be reflected in our fractal transcendent theory, although that's not a logical field theory. You said subsystem here, or just xy plane? The uh, it, can, plane? it doesn't need to be xy plane, it can be any plane. But, but so far, the transcendent, the fractal need transcendent right on this spatial for the xy plane? Or not really? uh, no, one actually, for example, uh, I would. But one two is coordinate one. One two is not coordinate. Oh, it's the indices. The indices. I only have two gauge fields. In principle, you can have more gauge fields, but this is the equation. Yeah, it was. Yeah. 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 Ye
And in the Uber transaction theory, this can be done by figuring out what is the worst line of criteria. So here, what the next step we want to do is, if we have a transaction theory, what is the Wilson line of criteria for such kind of fractal transaction theory? <coughs> here, for this theory, we actually have six type of Wilson line of criteria which can move in the i plus j or i minus j direction. So for example, if I create a Wilson line of criteria along the x plus y directions, I have all of the a1 operator along the straight line. What I will find is such kind of Wilson line commute with all of the terms in your transcendent theory, but at the end of the Wilson line, what it does is it creates a particle hole pair oriented in x minus y direction in a perpendicular direction, and this should be regarded as a dipole excitation. And because it's a transcendent theory, whenever we create a flux, we have charge, and once we have charge, we have flux as well. So here it's actually a uh, a charge dipole and it also carries flux, so it's a flux dipole as well. And in order to move this dipole and the other anti-dipole spatially separate part, what we can do is we can enlarge or shrink this Wilson line operator, which must be a straight line operator, to spatially separate them apart. Second, because A1 and A2 do not commute after perfectation, that means one Wilson line and the other Wilson line do not commute. So in principle, we can define the reading statistics, which I will not elaborate here. And third, because we have Wilson line operators, remember these Wilson line operators are straight, which means one Wilson line and its parallel Wilson line partner are actually independent. And by counting how many independent Wilson line operators can we generate, we will get a wrong state degeneracy, which do depend on the system size, and it also depends on the geometry termination of your theory. So in general, such a kind of fractal transcendent theory, although that's not no longer a logical field theory, it almost produce all of the reproduce all of the interesting features for the unit transcendent theory. It gap out the gauge spectrum, make it decomplete, and generate some global brown state degeneracy, which is pretty robust to any arbitrary perturbations. And uh, because of the Wilson line algebra, they introduce some natural grading statistics between these subdimensional particles in three spatial dimensions. And in 2 plus 1D transcendent theory, because there is some gauge anomaly on the boundary, the boundary have to be gapless. And same applies to our theory as well. If you make a gauge transformation that's invariant in the bulk, but on the boundary there are some gauge anomaly for this higher range gauge theory, and that indicates there are some gapless dipole currents propagating on the side faces. And same as the usual 2 plus 1 D theory, where we apply the electric operator, we can observe a current operator moving in a perpendicular direction. Here, if we apply a high rank electric field, we'll figure out there is a dipole current moving in a perpendicular direction to the electric operator you apply. So there's also a transverse response for such kind of fractonic chain sample theories. Does the compass degree of freedom depends on how you move the boundary? Yes, exactly. It only uh, survives on some special boundaries. Are, are, are those boundaries the planes you mentioned? Or not? Yes. And, yes. No, and there, there are no compass degrees of freedom if the boundary is not parallel to one. True. Yes. If you get a very rough boundary, then at least uh, at this stage, I can see why there is a gap of freedom as well. But that's only coming from so This the is very different from what generation science Yeah, and uh, the I don't know if there is a gravitational economy here. I'm not sure whether there's gravitation or not. So we don't know how to couple the first place. True. True. Question. question back here? Oh, probably a very stupid question. Why is there only like zero? I think she would probably ask this. Why is there only zero, one, two, and this is not that, like three? I'm sorry? Where is index three? There's no index three. It's not coordinates. It's not coordinate. IJ is one and two. You can have three. We can have three electric field. We can have three gauge field. Then the gauge flux operator, you at least will have two gauge flux operator. Then you can write on the transcendent theory then, but it will be pretty complicated because you have to decide which flux is, uh, which flux or which combination of flux is binding with your charge. So when you choose just one and two, it's that attached to specific directions in the. It's not direction. That's a flavor of the gauge field. That's the flavor of the gauge field. But, but what's the coordinate? When you write A1 partial 0, A2, then what, 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 what coordinate do you choose? Partial 0 is the time direction. Right, but what about A1, A2? 
like that one. Yes, A1, DTA2, A1, yes. So the gauge transformation, A1 is actually, A1 gauge transformation, here it is. That's A1 right. should transform as D1 alpha, and A2 should transform as D2 alpha. That's right, but, but uh, when you write it, there's a low, the transignment term. So A1 is also has some coordinates, right? Space coordinates. There's an unspecified coordinates. Yes, yeah, so it lives uh, at some place. So you choose x, t, y, y, t, z, z, t, x, for example. So a1, a1 t, is... A, a1, x, partial t, a2, y, for example. Yeah, yeah. okay, very good yes. question. So here, a1 and a2 live on the same side on the lattice. So, uh, so a1 live here, and a2 also live here. And when there are conjugate pairs, they're only conjugate pair if they stay on the on the same side. It's different from the 2 plus 1d, where a and a y actually live on different bonds, and there is an ambiguity. That's why the series even more well defined on the lattice. Back to the non-CSS code. Now, if I hit such kind of chain side field into a Z2 gauge field, which means A1 and A2 only take either 0 or pi, then we can represent A1 and A2 as the sigma x and sigma z operator. And for the chain side theory, for your low energy constraint, it's a pretty simple constraint. Constraint is the B flux must be zero everywhere on the lattice. And uh, write down the B flux operator in terms of the sigma x and sigma z operator, you will find such kind of stabilizer with x here, y here, and the z uh, y here and z here exactly correspond to the magnetic flux of operator in this minimum unit cell. And the reason here the magnetic flux is not totally represented by the z operator is once we have side of the the two gauge connections no longer commute. And that is why x, y, and z operator will appear on the same operator for the magnetic flux operator. And the magnetic flux operator actually already gives you the wrong state manifold of the two sum theory. So that's it. So in general, all of these fractal two sum theory can be extended. All we, need, all, we, all we need is first we need a generalized electromagnetic theory and we need this flux operator. And then what we need to do is we need to do flux attachment such so that charge is bound with the flux. And then we write on the chen theory and we have to figure out whether what are the possible choice for D1 and D2. One necessary but probably not sufficient condition is for chen theory, just to make a gauge invariant, you will find that the A1, uh, D1, D2 either contains all even derivatives or they all contain all odd derivatives. If one of them contain even and the other contain odd derivative, then the thing will become yield different because it's not gauge invariant in the bulk. And here we just list several simple differential polynomial. This corresponds to the q octahedral code, and this corresponds to some other non CSS code. And the one gave odd and the two even? Uh, no. So if D1 is all even derivative, then D2 is also all even derivative. You cannot take them as oh. this all even, this all odd. Then this one is non gauge invariant. But can I have D1 even and odd and D2 even and odd and odd? Uh, no. Then so again, this becomes non gauge invariant. If you just have a single flavor chain theory, uh -huh. if you have multi flavor chain theory, then different flavor can have different gauge transformation. Then it's still possible. Then that just becomes a So in summary, such kind of fractal chain sign theory is definitely not a topological quantum field theory, but we still call it chain signs because it almost produced all of the interesting features of the regular chain sign theory we are familiar with in 2 plus 1D. And upon hitting, we can display a lot of non-CSS code. And there are also some interesting fractal PF theory, which turn out to have a fully gap boundary, but the others hinge, and this kind of fractal PF theory can be regarded as the gauge inversion of the higher order TI protected by some subsystem symmetries. And finally, let me end my talk with some future directions. We already have lots of exactly subtle model for non-abelian fractal models, so it will be interesting to see whether we can find out a non-abelian fractal transcendent theory. And in the usual gauge theory, in a higher dimension, we have an exon coupling term, which means a charge can, a molecule can carry the charge, so we have a weight effect. It will be interesting to see whether such kind of fractal system can also have a dionic fractal where the higher rank gauge molecule also carries a fractal charge. All right, thank you. Questions? Um, 
Um, oh, yeah, I was going to ask. Um, so the case where you have the edge, the gapless edge modes, are in the foliating language. Should I think of them as by stacking um, 2D integer point of all effects? Mm, yeah, first actually, I think shear foliating may not appear here because the foliating is for the stabilizer code and we just uh, add some additional 2D stabilizer code or additional 2D logical field theory. But here, when I really am upon some local unitary transformation acting on the spin degree of freedom, whether they're equivalent or not. But here, actually, some of the operators really correspond to the gauge connection operators. And if you implement their local unitary gauge transformation, it happens that so you actually make the local unitary gauge transformation for the gauge connection, not to the physical degree of freedom, like the magnetic flux or electric operator. So I'm not sure how to, first, I'm not sure how to define foliate equivalents for such kind of pure gauge theory. And second is, for this model, it is not equivalent, at least for the model I mentioned today, it's not equivalent to, to, uh, to stacking 2D transcendence because if you just uh, stack 2D transcendent theory, then the charge can only move within the, uh, cannot go between the plane, but they can move within the plane. But what we find here is first, the charge can only move on a, on a specific direction. And second is for 2 plus 1D transcendent theory, there are, when you define them on the lattice, you need to be careful because AX, AY, they found different degree of freedom. So on a honeycomb lattice, there's no way for you to define a lattice transcendent theory. But here, different gauge connections, they found the same side. So their their conjugate relation is very well defined even on the lattice. Did you ever use the k as oh, sorry. Did you ever use the k as integer? Yes. Uh, k actually have to be integer up to some lattice spacing. Yeah. Okay, k can be start mentioned. And that is actually the lattice the, the lattice spacing of your uh, cubic lattice or the minimal length of the dipole. How do you argue that k has to be integer at uh, in In continuum, First, in continuum, the theory is really ill defined because when we say dipole, we need a minimal length of the dipole. If the dipole can approach each other, then they just become particle co pair which approach each other and annihilate. So, without a minimal UV regularization, I don't think this theory can be well defined. And only on lattice, we can argue K 